And Father, that a love, a love for you and a love for people, Lord God, that surpasses anything that they could ask or think. I ask you, Lord God, to use each one, Lord, to bring, be a light into this whole region. And I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Amen. Give them one more hand. Yes, 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 yes. Well, today is Father's Day, and uh, my title is Go Call Your Husband. Now, I know it's Father's Day, so uh, I want you to hear what I'm trying to say today. Uh, a man must have the ability to be a husband before a man can be a father. Now, I am aware that some of our fathers and some of you have, uh, have suffered divorce, but I want to tell you that that does not disqualify you from having the ability to be a husband. Amen? Uh, you have a great ability to be a husband. Uh, I was thinking about along those lines, and God, the Father, as great an ability as He had, He divorced natural Israel. So just to give you some insights there, uh, uh, that didn't stop Him from being a father. But He had the ability. They just didn't receive from him what they needed to receive. So I want to tell you today that uh, my title is Go Call Your Husband, but before the lesson's done, I'll change it. <laughs> so uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, turn to John chapter 4 with me. That's where we're going to be spending most of our time today. I have a couple of passages, scriptures, but other than that, uh, you can jot them down and read them later if you'd like. But John chapter 4, and while you're turning, I'm going to pray. Father, thank you. Father, thank you for the opportunity to do what I get to do. Thank you for my dad and my father. And Lord, I ask you to help me today as I attempt to minister to fathers and to men. Um, Lord, I, wanna, I want them to hear my heart and not my words. I want them to hear your spirit and what it has to say. I pray I won't talk too fast or too slow, that I'll be interesting, but most of all, I'll be anointed. And that as I sow the seed, it falls upon soil that'll bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I ask you to bless our time together. Make it meaningful. Make it mean something. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody says hallelujah. Amen. 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 Well, I want to read uh, you a part of an email that I received. I'm not going to read the whole email, but a part of it. And uh, it'll be on the screen so you can follow, follow, follow along with me. And this is what the email said. Father's Day is a tough day for some of us. Not only those that have lost their fathers through death suffered. There are some of us that suffer because our fathers live and yet remain dead to us. While I try to focus on the positive aspects of Father's Day, it is difficult to do this when I have a father living less than 10 miles away who may as well be, a millions, who may as well be millions away. Father's Day causes a sense of dread to well up in me. I dread going to see my natural father because I know how I know how the visit will go. Having a father that offers living water is crucial to having a family that is immersed in life. If you will allow me, I had no idea of what real life is until I met you and your family. I could see that you had something that was very different than what I had as a child. What was it? Simple. You had living water that flowed from your innermost being and washed everyone and everything that it came in contact with. Uh, there are fathers who bring life and there are men Though they have sired children, do nothing but serve them death. They allow from their lives to proceed 
a poison that poisons the wife, that poisons the children, and poisons the grandchildren. So my Father's Day message today is going to be a little different than normal. It's going to be a little heavier and a little more fatherly. And I want you to hear it. In the book of St. John, chapter 4, where I hope you are in your Bibles, we're, we're given a story about Jesus and a woman that he came in contact with. He had an encounter, and she had an encounter with him. And toward the end of that story, this woman leaves the well and goes to the city, and she says something that is quite interesting to me, and I wanted to share this with you, and I want to begin here as we begin looking at my topic, Go Call Your Husband. And it's in John chapter 4 and verse 28, and it says, The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man. It's interesting that she said to the men, come see a man. What is it that a man has or can possess that would be good enough for other men and should be something that other men should come and see? What is it that a man can have that a woman wants other men to come and see? What is it in my life that I want my children, my wife, people I love, my friends, my city to come and see? What is it that I'm allowing them to drink from me? Is it a poison? Or is it living water? I want to talk about this. Uh, and allow me, please, if you will, to refresh our memories about this beautiful story in John chapter 4 and what it's about. Um, Jesus was on his way, and he was passing through, he was on a journey, and he passed through an area called Samaria. Now, the Samaritans at one time were Jews, or, or Hebrews, not Jews, they were Hebrews. And they were part of the 12 tribes of Israel. And what had happened is 10 of those 12 tribes rebelled against Solomon's son named Rehoboam and went and created a new nation north of Jerusalem. In that new nation, they began idolatry. They began heavy idolatry. The northern kingdom was called Israel and the southern kingdom was called Judea. The northern kingdom of Israel became heavily involved with idol worship, which is extremely important because that idol worship that happened 700, 800 years B.C. was still affecting the Samaritan woman 800 years later. My point is this, whether you believe it or not, what has happened to your ancestors and what they allowed to happen in their lives and your father's has affected you. It has come down the pipes, 800, 1,000, and I can, we'll take it all the way back to Adam before I'm done today. It's come down the pipe to you, and until you change it, it's going to go on from you to your children, to your grandchildren. And one of the saddest things to me is that when I sit and talk to a grandfather who is weeping, over his grandchild being mistreated. And as I investigated and talked to the man about the situation, I find out that his son or daughter that is mistreating the grandchild learned that behavior from him. The one now crying. It is learned behavior. It comes down the pipe. It comes down the, the, the ways to us through our generations. And this woman... This Samaritan woman had learned behavior because of idol worship of the fathers. Now God judged that idol worship, and he sent the armies of Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon to come into the northern kingdom of Judah, and he put them in Babylonian captivity. The whole area was under his rule. And what Nebuchadnezzar did, and God allowed him to do, 
was to go into all of the world and bring all different races and all different religions into that area. It was as though as God was saying, okay, if you want idol worship, here it is. Eat it until it comes out your nose. And they brought all of these races in and all of these, all of these religions in, and it became a very mixed up bunch of folk. Not only mixed in religion, but mixed up in their spirits, mixed up in their lives. And what's so sad today is that when I look at children whose fathers have never stopped the curse, I see mixed up children, Samaritans. And it was through here that Jesus was traveling this day. And Jesus was traveling up through this area of Samaria. And he encounters this woman at a well that's called Jacob's well. And he begins a conversation with her. And he asks for water. Very simple introduction into an evangelistic outreach. Can I have a glass of water? And he begins a conversation with her. And then he immediately changes the natural conversation into a spiritual conversation. And he says... But if you wanted real water, if you wanted something that would never cause you to thirst again, never allow you to thirst again, then you would ask me for water. And he changes the conversation and begins to give her a mini sermon on evangelism or salvation. And he has her to the place where she wants this water. She's wanting it. She's saying, I want you to give me this water. And then he, I want to read you the verse right now. But what I really want you to see is not so much what he said to her or what she says to him about asking for the water, but the very next thing that Jesus says to her after she asked for it. Don't miss that. It is the very next thing he says. So in John chapter 4 and verse 15, it says this. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, go call your husband and come back. Jesus changed the subject, right? He abruptly changed it. Here's a woman wanting to get, come into the kingdom of God, and he just changes the subject on her. Is that what he did? Did he change the subject or did he? No. Sir, the living water for your wife and for your family is in you. This woman's living water had to do with her husband. Go get your husband and come back. See, the thing I really want us to see is that you can be a man and not be a father. You can have a marriage license and not be a husband. We'll not be that until we produce living water. Oh, we can sire children. We can live with a woman. But until a life produces living water, that stops generational curses, that rears our children in the love of God and His kingdom and the love of people, then we're really not fathers. Until we come to a place where we bring life to our wives and life to our children, we're not husbands and we're not fathers. Now, I know this is the context here. I know this is exactly what Jesus is doing because of what he says to her. She says, give me this water. He says, go get your husband. And then what he says to her lets me know this is exactly what he's talking about here. The very next verse, which is verse 17, I'm going to read 16, 17, and 18, just right down the line here. Verse 16 again says, he told her, go call your husband and come back. Verse 17 says, I have no husband. She replied, Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband, and I capitalize these just to get the emphasis. What you have just said is quite true. 
See, a man does not make a husband, and having a marriage license does not make a husband or father. A husband and a father will provide living water. See, strange things happen in our home if, uh, if we don't provide this living water. The woman at the well was searching for a relationship. Um, she was looking for love in all the wrong places. She was searching for a relationship, and her mind was is that it was going to take a man. Jesus says, no, it's not going to take a man. It's going to take a husband. You've been looking all of these places and now having all of these relationships, and you will never be quenched in your thirst until you have a husband. Um, how many relationships does it take to quench a thirst? So what I really want you to hear is your wife is thirsty. She's not thirsty for a man. She's thirsty for living water. How many relationships does it take? How many marriages will it require? I want to make certain that we see this from another viewpoint uh, as well. A woman finding Jesus alone will not satisfy her thirst. Here's this woman standing at the well with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but she's still thirsty. I know great women, widows, singles, married, great women who love Jesus with all their heart, but still thirst for a husband. Now they think they're thirsting for a man until they get him. <laughs> oh, God, help me. <laughs> See, what they're thirsting for is a husband, someone who has living water, and they're not just thirsting it for themselves, sir. They want living water for their children. They want living water for their grandchildren. One of the most frightening things I ever said to someone was, what's so sad in this situation is this is going to be what your grandchildren, this is how your grandchildren are going to be treated. Because this is how your children are treated. It's a shaking thing when you really think about it. And it doesn't matter how old or your age concerning this. I know some elderly ladies who love Jesus, who stand at the well with Him, have communication with Him all the time, but they're still thirsting for that husband. She's thirsting for living water. And I know... Church, that today I'm talking to us dads and us fathers and us men, but I want to tell all of you ladies as well, your husband thirst. How many relationships will it require him? How many marriages will it require of him? You can provide for him living water. Go call your husband and come back, Jesus said. You see, it's the man and the woman coming back together to Jesus. That living water is produced through. Um, now, let me take a moment here. I'll let everybody take a deep breath. Um, we have fathers in LifeGate Church who diligently seek after living water who are living water, and you diligently seek to provide a life so that your wife and your children and your grandchildren can drink from you. I am so proud of you. I tell people all the time, come and see a man. 
I'll be, I'll be counseling with people and I will tell them, watch this family, watch this man, watch this woman. If you really want to see what it should be about and how to live it, watch this. And I am so proud of you. I am so proud of each one of us that are really diligently seeking water that will quench the thirst of our, of our lives and our wives and our children and our grandchildren. Now let's try to get a little bit closer to the Father's Day part of the message. <laughs> See, a man cannot be a father until he's living a living water husband. Now again, you've, you, you've already gotten my take on, on the divorce thing. And divorce does not qualify you from having living water. It can simply mean that your ex just didn't want to drink living water. We men need to provide living water for our wives. And we've all known males who did anything but. We've all known males who provided poisoned Kool-Aid to their children, who flavored the poison and called it father or dad. Our husband. But actually it was just Kool-Aid, poison that poisoned their spirit and poisoned their soul. And sometimes abused their body. We've all known individuals like that. But I'm not only talking about the absent dads or, or you know, those kinds of things or living dads or whatever. I'm, I'm not only talking about that. As I, was, as I was thinking about this, you know, my mind began to think about the scriptures and, and the people that are in the scriptures. He said, what are we really providing for our children and our wives to drink? See, sometimes we provide the wrong thing. Sometimes we provide for them to drink of our alcoholism and they become alcoholics. Or sometimes we provide them to drink from us of... Uh, bondages that we are in, such as financial bondages. And so all of, our, all of their lives, they're going to be in financial bondage just like we were. They drank that from us. They drink anger from us, and they become angry people. They drink from us. They drink, uh, uh, they drink uh, the lack of coming to church on a, on a consistent basis, and so their lives become idolatrous. If you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something. We let them drink from us. We let them drink from us our bondages. We let them drink from us our, our, our profanity. I was thinking about this, and I couldn't help but think of David. You see, I'm not, I want to I make sure that we're all on the same page, just providing a nice house and nice cars and, and all the things that your child needs does not mean you're a good husband or a good dad. I was thinking about King David. King David was king. I mean, he had a palace. You know what I mean? They had the biggest house on the block. All the kids, man, they had the finest clothes and the neatest haircuts and the fastest mules. <laughs> David talked a great game. Read the Psalms. Oh, love God with all your heart. Cry out to God. He talked a great game until you looked at his children. Whoa. See, David had a lot of wives and a lot of concubines. So guess what Solomon did? Did Solomon have more or less than David had? More. It doesn't get easier, it gets worse. It amplifies in our children. It has amplified in us. We got something from our parents, and unless we really dealt with it, it got worse. David took what he wanted. He wanted another man's wife, so he took her and murdered her husband. David had a son named Absalom. He wanted David's wives. And he wanted to murder David. So he tried to murder David and he took his wives. Another son named Amnon. Amnon saw all this going on with his dad. Amnon wanted his half-sister, his stepsister, named Tamar. He took her. He raped her. Dad did it. And this amplifies in our children. 
I want us to hear. There has to be a place where we deal with this stuff. There has to be a, a recognition of what learned behavior is. We, our children learn to behave from us. From mom and dad, they learn to be mom or dad. From our daddy, our now mama, they learn to be grandparents. They learn how life works by watching those fathers. I don't think we understand the severity of being a parent and specifically being a father today. So I've got a, a couple of scriptures here I want to give you. This out of, uh, one's out of 1 King, which shows kind of the negative aspect of the thing, that how it does come down and amplifies. And then the second one is how it's fixed. 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 22 says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy and their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. See, it didn't get less, it got more. Sins of the fathers is a biblical doctrine that runs from Genesis to Revelation. And then in Nehemiah 9.2, we find him dealing with it. In 9.2, here's what it says, And the seed of Israel separated themselves. First thing you have to do is identify the problem and separate yourself from it. Separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. First thing we have to realize is, is that I got this from dad. Somebody up my line helped me here, whether it be good or whether it not be good. And what they did then is they dealt with it. They recognized it. They confessed it. Here it is. I see where it's coming from now. They separated themselves from it and they repented. And until that happens in any of us, we're just going to carry it on to our children and our grandchildren. Abraham had a fault. And his fault was he feared his life when he got around pharaohs and kings. And he knew that he had a beautiful wife and that they would kill him to get her. And so he would, as it were, pimp her, let her go to their harems. And you know what Isaac did? You know, Isaac did the identical thing with Rebecca, his wife. Some of you are, you read, you, some of you need to read the Bible. You'd be amazed at some of the pornographic stories that are in there. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what happens. Jacob, his name means deceiver, supplanter. He deceived his own dad, did he not? His own brother, did he not? Well, guess what happens to Jacob with his boys? Yeah, this animal ate Joseph. Here's his coat of many colors that you gave him. And you see it comes right down the pipe. And you can read the Bible and you can read in Judges and 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles and you can read all about the sins of the fathers coming to the next generation, the next generation, and the next generation. And here's this woman at this well who has had 800 years of it coming down the tubes to her. But just as sure as we can get the bad stuff from parents, we can get the good stuff. Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, was specifically selected to raise the very Son of God. Now we understand that Mary was handpicked. Holy Ghost came to Mary. The angels come to Mary. But so did they come to Joseph. In fact, they told Joseph, you will marry this woman. <laughs> And here's what the Bible says of Joseph. And Joseph was such a consistent person and such an honorable person. And here's what it says of him in Matthew 1, 19. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Joseph lived right. Joseph was a very spiritual man. 
He was very sensitive to angelic visitations and visitations from the Holy Spirit. But don't stop there. We see the impact that he had upon Jesus. He was handpicked to bring living water to the very Son of God. But don't stop there. He was living water to Mary. He was living water. And they had a big family. There was a bunch of those kids. And look at all of them. And all of them became very godly, righteous people. From Joseph. He was a very consistent man. In Luke 2.41 it says this. Now his parents, Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year. How often? Every year at the feast of the Passover. And when it was, when he was 12, Jesus, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. It was Joseph's custom to do this on a consistent basis. Joseph was a consistent man. And, and Father, if I can give you any secret at all to fathering and being a real father, it's consistency. It's, it's, it's doing what you say you're going to do and do it consistently. Don't beat the fire out of them one time and then go for seven months and not beat them again. <laughs> Hey, you got the point across. That's probably, I probably could have said that better. But, but be consistent with your discipline. When you say you're going to do something, then do it. Joseph was that way. He was a consistent man. And every year he would do these, these feast things. You know, there were three of them. And, and, and I'm sure they went to all of them. But it was no small undertaking to, to load up all those kids and all those, family, all those people and, and, and take off. And he provided living water. Now, Joseph is a very interesting character because we, he wasn't at the cross and we don't know at what time he died. But he left a Christ in the earth. He left an apostolic generation. See, James, one of Jesus' brothers, half-brothers, became an apostle. Jude wrote the book of Jude. James wrote the book of James. He left a Christ in the earth when he left. And he left a generation that was going to bring in the kingdom. You see, that's what we're here for, dads. We're here to leave something, a Christ in the earth, that will carry it on after we're gone. And Joseph did that because he was consistent and he brought living water. And strange things happen in our homes when us men, when us fathers don't bring living water in when we just stand around and let things happen and let the generational curses and, and the things happen that's come down the pipe and we don't stand up and, and go against it. You see, the serpent will come into your garden. David, Adam, anyone. And he's heading for Eve, sir. And he's going to give her something to drink that she thinks is going to quench her thirst. And all you're going to do is stand around. If you do, you're going to lose your garden. Cain's going to be birthed. And it goes downhill from there. And we can all look back and see that whatever that we're going through goes all the way back to Adam. And until we stand up and not give the serpent a place in our homes, we're going to lose our gardens. The woman at the well had been spiritually deceived just as was Eve. Neither her fathers nor the men in her life ever gave her living water. They just gave her deception. John chapter 4 and verse 20 says this, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. This is the woman speaking. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. In other words, you worship at Zion, we worship on this mountain. Which one's right? See, the woman had learned behavior from her fathers. 800 years of all of this learned behavior. But Jesus is telling her, you can stop that right now. She had learned behavior from her dad, from her granddad, from her relationships, from the leaders of the city, 
from the men that she had acquaintance with, and no one gave her anything but poison. Finally, there's a man who's offering her living water. Come see a man. So much of what's happening in our lives and in our homes today is learned idolatry. Just as this woman learned idolatry from her fathers, we've learned whatever that we have from our fathers as well. See, what we have is the generation of fathers that have come to us and what turns into idolatry. We get hung up on the wrong things. And it becomes an idol to us. Oh, we don't go over on this hill and bow and worship and burn incense, perhaps. But perhaps money has become an idol to you. It keeps you from Wednesday night services or church on Sundays. Perhaps <laughs> your children are drinking from you, talking about people. Because that's an idol to you. And you feel like if you can talk about people and make others look bad, it makes you look better. Now, let's put those holy rollers down. That justifies me not going. And we create an idol worship, and we look at our children, and they're so mixed up. And what we've really created was another generation of Samaritans. And until they have an encounter with Jesus, it'll never change. Jesus says, but we can change it right now, ma'am. John 4.23 says this, Yet a time is coming and has now come. When had it come? Now. I want you to hear that. You can change it right now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is a spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. I want to encourage all our dads that it can change right now. Whatever's come down the pipes to you, whatever you've learned behavior from your fathers, whatever's been amplified into your life, you can stop it right now. So worship's not only lifting our hands on Sunday morning and maybe falling on our face and, 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 and those kinds of things that we do here on Sunday morning. Worship is what your children really see you do at home. It's what they drink of you. Jesus wasn't concerned here about how we clap our hands or lift our hands. It's how we really worship when no one's looking. But I want to tell you, Dad, your children are looking. They can tell you how much you pray, if you read your Bible, if you give to the kingdom. They can tell you how you act when you're angry. They can tell you what you do when somebody crosses paths with you and you go home and get out of their presence and how you talk, whether it's negative or positive. They know about your finances. They know if you're in debt. They know if you've got pornography hinted under the bed. They know. And they're drinking it. But it can stop right now. They watch us worship. John 4.27 says this. And then upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why seekest thou with or why speakest why talkest thou with her? And the woman then left her water pot went her way into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So we're marveling at something. We're marveling at our society. Our society has marveled us, and we've tried to become like the society, much like these disciples had. These disciples were marveling because society says that you shouldn't be talking to this lowly little Samaritan woman. And they marveled at that, did the disciples. And they were missing the living water. What is marveling you? 
What marveled the woman was this man. Come see a man. Come see this guy who's got living water. Come see this guy who can tell you about life. Which one are we marveling at? Have we been so affected by society that we've lost what's really important? Are we missing it? Uh, God forbid. But if your obituary were written tomorrow, how would it read? I, uh, I ran across this this week, and I, 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 it was so good to me that I wanted to share it with you. So I want you to read along with me about this particular story. Toward the end of the 19th century, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel awoke one morning to read his own obituary in the local newspaper. Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before, and he died a very rich man. Actually, it was Alfred's older brother who had died. A newspaper reporter had bungled the epitaph. But the account had a profound effect on Nobel. He decided he wanted to be known for something other than developing the means to kill people efficiently and for amassing a fortune in the process. So he initiated the Nobel Prize, the award for chemists and writers who foster peace. Nobel said, every man ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. Few things will change us as much as looking at our life as though it were finished. So, sir, if uh, your life was finished, what living water have you left? Will we leave a Mary and a James and a Jude? and a Jesus, a Christ in the earth. You see, I believe you will. I believe that right now you're looking at your life and you know if you need to change your epitaph. And God wants you to. And he says, all you got to do is identify it. All you got to do is separate, confess it to me, and repent. I'll help you. I want you to. I want to bless your children. I want to bless your grandchildren. I want there to continue on after you a Christ in the earth, an apostolic generation who really wants to see the kingdom of God come in. I want you to become living water to your wife and to your children and to your grandchildren. Come see a man. Now, I want to end today with this thought. I want to thank our dads at LifeGate. Again, we've got the greatest dads. I know you, nearly everyone, personally. I know your life, and you desire what I'm talking about. You desire to produce for your family living water. And I know you're going to, to even help your epitaph as it is now. I know you're going to. And so I want to encourage you and I want to thank you not only for the living water that you bring to your family and to your children, but for the living water that you bring to this church and that you bring to this region. Every place you go, you touch lives. And I'm thankful for you. So I began the sermon with this title, Go, Bring Your Husband. But I want to change it. Okay, can I change it? I want to change the title now to Come, see a man. Come and see a man. That's what I want LifeGate to be, is a place where people can come and see a man who has living water. And I'm not talking about an individual. I'm talking about a body of believers that can come and bring living water to a lot of families and lives. So how many uh, of us are going to Look at our epitaph and change it if necessary and allow God to really take us and use it. Would you raise your hand and give the Lord a hand if you're going to do that? Hallelujah. 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 Shout to the Lord. Amen.
And I know it's kind of been heavy. You still have me, right? <laughs> I need to know if I need to, when I go out to shake hands, we just keep on going or if it's okay to hang around. <laughs> 